Hi there, and thanks for joining us to learn about trading options in your RRSP and TFSA. My name is Jason Ayers. I'm a derivatives market specialist by designation. I'm director of business development and a derivative strategist with RN Croft Financial Group. I am a member of the Croft uh, Group Investment Review Committee, as well as a member of the board of directors, educational consultant for Learn to Trade Global, and an educator for the TMX Montreal Exchange. As always, we just want to make sure that everybody realizes that the information that we're going to be discussing here today is for educational purposes only. The options market, not unlike any financial security, uh, security has its risks, and we just want to make sure that everybody understands those risks before they go ahead and start trading these strategies within their portfolios. So we're going to take a look, first of all, at uh, some of the objectives and considerations um, with respect to managing one's registered accounts. We're going to talk about the eligible option strategies. We're going to do a quick review of the basics. And then I want to uh, share some examples. We're going to look at buying a call. We're going to look at buying a put as stock replacement strategies. And then we'll discuss income generation through covered call writing as well as portfolio hedging through the use of a protective put. So let's first take a look at some of our objectives and considerations. The first um, objective typically for an RSP is just really making sure that you're saving enough um, for a comfortable retirement. The second, of course, and probably right up there at the top of the list is preventing a substantial drawdown um, within a, uh, an income fund uh, so that ultimately you have enough cash flow and enough uh, uh, of, of, um, uh, of a portfolio in order to facilitate the um, monthly payouts that you may need uh, during your retirement years. The also, the also um, you, know, you want to consider the idea of compounding growth within a tax-free savings account. Of course, the opportunity to be able to generate capital gains without having the uh, burden of taxation uh, on those gains. Um, is uh, is a great benefit of the tax-free savings account. So there's some strategies we're going to talk about here, which um, discuss the idea of leveraging your uh, your capital and uh, with a limited risk exposure, and subsequently being able to grow uh, those assets over a period of time, and then compound that growth, of course, uh, for further uh, benefit. Um, for those of you that are parents, also the idea of being able to ensure that there are funds available for your children's education. So uh, the strategies that we're going to talk about here today, not just applicable within your tax-free savings account, your RSPs, your RIFs and, and LIFs, et cetera, but uh, also within your RESPs uh, that um, you, know, you can use to help build and protect your children's education fund. So in many cases, really, if we want to sort of distill down what our objectives are around our registered accounts, we want to first to protect our funds, preserve our capital, make sure that we've got uh, enough investments there uh, for our future. We want to make sure that we're able to generate consistent returns. And uh, finally, taking advantage, as I mentioned, of the, uh, the, the tax benefit of utilizing a tax-free savings account um, through um, leveraging our assets um, with a managed risk exposure. So the strategies that are available to us, we can purchase calls instead of buying stocks or exchange traded funds. So we'd be looking at the purchase of a call as a long stock replacement strategy. We can also buy calls to secure the future uh, purchase price of shares we want to own. So in other words, lock in today's price with a limited amount of capital. And then subsequently, uh, if and when we feel it's appropriate within the uh, expiration cycle of that option contract, we can decide to exercise our right, put up the capital that is required and buy the uh, underlying stock. We can also um, implement the covered call writing strategy. So again, the idea that we can reduce volatility uh, and generate cash flow through call writing on stocks that are options eligible within our RSPs, TFSAs, etc. Um, we can buy puts instead of short selling. So we would look at the purchase of puts as a short stock replacement strategy. Uh, and we can also buy puts as a uh, as an insurance against uh, against loss on our stock. So in other words, we could implement the protective put strategy uh, for uh, hedging purposes. So let's just do a quick review of our rights and obligations, uh, as well as our contract specifications around the different options uh, that we're going to be uh, discussing here. So first of all, uh, let's take a look at the call option. So remember that the call option buyer pays a premium and secures a right to buy the underlying security at a specific price 
And that right is valid over a specific period of time. Now that premium is paid to the call option seller, or uh, we also refer to that, uh, that position as being the writer. And so the call option writer collects the premium, but is paid to take on an obligation to sell or deliver the underlying shares at a specific price. And again, that obligation is valid over a specific period of time. Now, as far as the put options are concerned, the put option buyer, again, pays a premium, but that premium is paid to secure the right to sell the underlying shares at a specific price. And again, that obligate, or sorry, that right is valid over a specific period of time. Now, that premium that is paid by the put option buyer is collected by the put option seller or writer and that put option writer takes on an obligation to buy the underlying shares at a specific price and again that obligation is valid over a specific period of time. Remember that one contract represents 100 shares of the underlying security so this becomes a very important consideration uh, when you're looking at combining a, um, a stock position with an options overlay. So in other words, if we're implementing the covered call strategy, we would have 100 shares of the underlying security for every one call option that we want to sell uh, against, uh, against those shares that we, uh, that we own. Remember that the price of the contract as we are looking at it in an options chain is reflected in a, um, uh, in a per share uh, format. So 100 um, we would apply a 100 unit multiplier to determine the total cost of one contract. So for example, if we we're looking at a contract listed at $1.25, because the option contract represents 100 shares, the value of that contract would be $125. Each contract also has a unique strike price and expiration date. So this becomes a very important consideration. Uh, when you're looking at, um, um, you know, uh, creating a position based on the objectives that you're setting out to, uh, to meet, um, you're going to adjust your strike price and your expiration date accordingly, depending upon uh, what it is that you're looking to accomplish. So we're going to discuss here the idea of trading a directional view. So this would be uh, from a bullish perspective. So first of all, we talked about the idea of utilizing a call option as a long stock replacement strategy. So the idea is that the buyer of a call option believes that the stock is going to go up in value. So we're looking at this once again as a stock purchasing replacement strategy. Now the benefit of this is that we're actually able to generate leverage as you're going to see uh, in our uh, example coming up here. Um, where this becomes a really interesting opportunity is that is is when you know we is realizing that we can't trade on margin in a registered account. So basically, if we want to buy, um, you know, if we want to take position, let's say in a thousand shares of a particular stock, we have to come up with the entire amount of money associated with buying all of those one thousand shares. But what we can do um, is we can actually buy a call option at a fraction of a price. And we can control those thousand shares with less money. And the benefit of this, of course, is that we can't lose more than the premium paid. So the opportunity here is that we've created a leveraged position with a limited and identifiable risk exposure. So let's compare the idea of buying a stock um, or shares in a particular company uh, versus uh, purchasing a, uh, an option as a stock replacement strategy. So let's consider two investors that are both bullish, uh, bullish sorry, on LOL Corp. And they've got a price target of $27 per share over the next five months. So if we've got Peter here as the stock buyer, Peter is going to buy 1,000 shares of LOL Corp at $22. And he's going to pay out $22,000 in order to take on that position. Now, remember, this is in a registered account. So Peter can't trade on margin. There's no leverage through margin here. If you want to control or if you want to own 1,000 shares, you're tying up, um, in this case, uh, at $22 per share, $22,000. Jackie, on the other hand, is is um, educated in the options world, and even though she wants to take on the same position, 
um, she can do so without putting up the same amount of capital. So with LOL uh, Corp at $22, Jackie can go out, um, look at the 22 uh, strike price call option that's expiring in June and can in fact pay $1.50 or $150 per contract to, to gain that exposure. Now remember, in order to um, mimic uh, 1,000 shares of the underlying security, because each contract controls 100 shares, Jackie's going to buy 10 contracts. So 10 times um, $150 per contract means that Jackie's going to pay out $1,500. So again, just to quickly compare, Peter the stock buyer is putting up $22,000 to buy the stock at $22 per share. Jackie is going to put up $1,500 to control the stock at $22, uh, at $22 uh, per share. Now, if we put these positions side by side, let's look at the uh, Peter, the stock buyer's position first. So again, 1,000 shares of LOL, he puts up $22,000. Now, we want to recognize that the risk is undefined. In other words, sure, if the company goes bankrupt and the stock goes to zero, we know that, that Peter's going to lose $22,000 of his investment. But if the stock goes down a dollar tomorrow, $2, $5, $7, there's really no defined risk. So Peter doesn't know uh, from one day to the next what the risk exposure on that position is. It's undefined and effectively um, it's unlimited down to zero. Now, if the shares as anticipated hit $27, well, that's a $5 appreciation in, uh, in the share value, which means that for Peter's $22,000 risk exposure, he has the opportunity here, if he um, closes the position, to lock in a $5,000 profit. So pretty good trade, but again, remember, undefined risk, unlimited upside. If we compare Jackie's position here, remember Jackie bought 10 uh, 22 strike calls expiring in June, paid $1.50 per contract, so put out $1,500 per share. Now, the important consideration here is Jackie's risk is defined and limited to $1.50 or the 1500 per share or the $1,500 that, uh, that she's put up to buy the contract. If the shares hit $27 before expiration, Jackie has to consider giving up that dollar, uh, $1.50 premium. Remember, the call option writer collects that premium. That's the, the, um, the benefit of being the writer is that you do get to collect that premium. So what Jackie has to do with the shares at 27 is subtract that $1.50 from the $5 difference between the 22 strike that she bought and the $27 target that it's, that it's hit. So in other words, Jackie's um, profit is the, the difference between the strike and the settlement value of 27 minus the cost of the premium. In this case, $3.50. So what we want to recognize is Jackie defined her risk at $1.50, but had the opportunity to make, in this case, $3.50 of, um, per, um, per contract. So the comparison, stock position, undefined unlimited risk exposure with unlimited upside potential with the uh, call option position, limited and defined risk to the, pre to the extent of the premium that you've paid with, again, in, uh, same as the stock, an unlimited upside potential. So let's move on to um, take a look at trading a um, a, a directional view from a bearish perspective. Now, remember, why we're buying a put option in this case is because we're bearish. Um, instead of short selling the stock, we, we are looking to use the put option as a bearish stock replacement strategy. So the buyer of the put believes that the stock is going to go down in value. This becomes an alternative to short selling the stock. Very, very important consideration here is that you can't short shares in a registered account. So you really have no way of, of taking a, a, a definitive bearish position on a specific stock um, unless you consider embracing the idea of utilizing a put option. Now, much like the call option, the other benefit to this is that you gain leverage. So in other words, you can't trade on margin. You can't short sell stock in, in your um, registered accounts. 
but you can buy a put option. You can control a short position um, in a uh, in the underlying shares with a um, small amount of capital, and you can't lose more than the premium that you've paid. So once again, let's compare the idea of buying a put option instead of short selling the stock. So in this case, our two investors are both bearish on DED Incorporated and have price targets down to $60 per share over the next um, five months. So we've got John, the short seller here, who is, uh, again, and be, John can't do this in his registered account, remember, but John is bearish on DED and short sells 1,000 shares of the stock at $72. Now, in this case, he shorted $72,000 worth of stock, worth of the stock. Now, remember, the, the objective of the short seller is to short the stock, collect the $72,000 here. If the stock drops in value, then the short seller can buy to cover the short position at a lower cost. So, in other words, if the stock um, drops from 72, 72 to 70, then John has collected 72,000, but only has to give back 70,000 to cover the position and ultimately collects the, uh, the $2,000 profit, all right? So there's John, the short seller. Now here we have Jackie. Jackie understands options, also bearish on DED Incorporated, but instead of short selling in her, in her RSP or TFSA or any other registered account, Jackie's gonna buy 10, June 72 strike puts. This gives Jackie the right to sell the stock at $72, right? And Jackie is paying $6.50 per contract or $650 per contract in order to take on that position. So rather than putting up the $72,000 required to short the stock, Jackie's going to pay $6,500 to assume the position. So she is buying the right to short the stock at $72. And in this case, with the June options, those, those that right is valid for five months. So let's compare the two positions here. We've got the short stock, stock um, uh, the, the, the um, short seller, John, uh, on the one side, and we've got the put option buyer, Jackie, on the other. So let's look at John's position here. Remember, John shorted 1,000 shares of DED put up $72,000 in order to take on that position. John's risk is undefined if the shares go up in value. So recognize that if John takes in $72,000, what his objective is is that if the stock drops, he's going to buy to cover at, um, at the lower price and keep the difference between the price at which he shorted the shares at and the uh, price at which he was able to cover. But remember, if the shares go up in value from 72 to 73 to 75, John collected 72,000, has to give back 73, 75, 78,000 in order to cover the position. So it continues to incur losses as the shares move higher. If we take a look at his profit potential to the downside, if DED shares hit $60 before the uh, expiration, now I should um, uh, just uh, make a point here of recognizing that, that there is no expiration date on the stock position, <coughs> pardon me, but recognize there is, of course, on the option position, whether it's a call uh, or a put. But in this case, if we're looking at that five-month time horizon and the DED shares hit $60 bef before the expiration of the option contract for comparative purposes, that's a $12 uh, profit per share for John. Uh, shorted at 72,000, bought the cover at 60, keeps the difference, that's $12 per share. Now let's take a look at Jackie's position. Now Jackie bought 10 uh, um, 72 strike put options expiring in June. So in this case, um, we're looking at a five month time horizon. Jackie's paid $6.50 per contract or uh, uh, per share or $650 per contract for a total exposure of $6,500. Again, compare the, the capital allocation here um, um, for the short seller putting up $72,000 for the put option buyer putting up $6,500. What I'll just um, 
draw your attention to, again, just to circle back to objectives here, if you have a tax-free savings account, for example, with a limited amount of, of uh, capital available to you, the ability to be able to take that capital and um, you know, limit the amount that you're required to put up on, on any one position allows you to sort of diversify across a, a number of different stocks um, you know, and, and again, leverage your capital more effectively with a limited risk exposure um, by utilizing the options as the stock replacement strategy. So in this case, um, if the shares go up in value, understand that Jackie's risk here is limited to the premium that she's paid at $6.50 per contract. If the shares drop as anticipated, the, the, the profit on the put position is the difference between the 72 um, strike price uh, and the settlement value of the shares at 60, which is 12. But again, just like that call option, the, the um, put option buyer has to give up the premium. That premium actually goes to the put option writer. So you subtract that premium from the profit. So in this case, $12 minus $6.50 gives a profit of $5,500 here. So the, the limited risk um, yielded a, um, a, an unlimited profit potential. In this case, we, you know, we hit the target. So Jackie's selling the position out or closing the position. Um, so Jackie has created a position whereby she's put up a, a um, limited amount of capital with a limited risk exposure for the opportunity to take advantage of the stock um, dropping. And as it hits the target, Jackie's made the difference between the strike price, uh, between the uh, settlement value, less the strike price, and then less the premium paid. So let's move on to the idea of income generation through uh, covered call writing. So the strategy is relatively simple. You're going, you buy or already own the underlying shares and you're going to get paid a premium up front for taking on the obligation to sell the shares. Now, you are going to be you are going to obligate yourself based on the strike price that you've chosen to sell those shares at a specific price and that obligation is going to be valid for a specific period of time. And you can choose um what price uh you uh, are comfortable uh selling those shares at. And you could also choose the time frame in which uh, you want this position to be in place as well. So it's all going to be based on your, uh, your objectives. So if we just go back and we compare option buyers and sellers, remember that Jackie, the option buyer, pays a premium. And that premium goes to the option seller for taking on an obligation to deliver the underlying shares. So it's important, uh, again, to, to understand that Jackie, the option buyer here, has one specific objective, and Peter, the option seller, has another specific objectives, objective. And they can be completely different, but at the end of the day, they're both going to be utilizing the same option contract to meet those independent objectives. Right? Jackie may feel that the stock is going to move higher over the next five months and ultimately wants to take on that position, uh, you know, limited risk exposure and an opportunity to leverage her capital. Peter has perhaps had the position in place for quite some time and is just looking for a way to get paid to generate some cash flow and is OK with giving up the shares within that five month period at the price at which he's obligated through the uh, through the sale of the put right. Now, why would you do this? Again, it's really important psychologically for the investor to um, really have a good comfort level with the covered call strategy because at the end of the day really what you are doing is you are taking on a premium and ultimately um, giving up uh, the upside potential for the stock or any further upside now you can choose how much upside potential you leave by um, you know selecting a strike price to sell that's maybe further out of the money but your intention here is to um, you know basically to, to create static income and also, um, you know, provide some added protection by reducing your cost base. So for every, you know, 25 cents that you collect as the option writer, that actually lowers the cost base of your underlying shares and uh, ultimately reduces the volatility within your portfolio. Now, 
the interesting consideration here is you don't really require the investment to increase in value to make profits. So even if the stock sort of stayed the same, went up a little bit, went down a little bit, what have you, if you on a month to month basis are constantly selling these options, you're generating cash flow, you're generating a return uh, on a month to month basis. And again, that's if you're retired uh, and, and you're looking to generate cash flow to help meet, uh, you know, a paycheck on a monthly basis. You know, this really, really adds to, um, uh, you know, adds to your ability to do that. So you combine this, let's say, with dividends uh, and you've got yourself a really uh, great way to generate that cash flow, um, you know, to meet your monthly uh, paycheck requirements. So let's just uh, take a look at some of the option writing basics here. So. Um, first of all, the covered call strategy tends to be held right until expiration. Now, you can buy the call back to alleviate your obligation to deliver the shares, but ultimately, the covered call writer tends to sell the call option and just let that uh, contract, uh, you know, let that position stay in place uh, all the way uh, till the, um, you know, till the end of the expiration. Now, at expiration, one of two things are going to happen. Either the option is going to get uh, exercised and you get assigned to deliver the shares. Again, psychologically, you prepared yourself for giving up those shares at that uh, specific price or the option expires. So, you you know, the option expires worthless. You uh, keep the entire premium and you turn around and you continue to uh, sell those options, you know, month over month until you get assigned. So if we uh, take a look at an example here, you've got Peter once again buys a thousand shares of XYZ. Peter's going to pay $22 per share, uh, put up to, putting up $22,000. A three-month call option at the 23 strike is uh, paying $0.40. Cents. So what happens here is Peter's going to sell 10 calls. Remember, we got got 1,000 shares. It's going to collect $400 and, and, and take on the obligation to sell those 1,000 shares uh, over the next three months at $23. So not only does Peter still have a little bit of an upside opportunity on the stock, but Peter also is going to collect the um, that cash flow uh, for taking on that uh, that obligation. So what that equates to is about a 1.85% return over the three months or a 7.8% uh, annualized return. So again, just just that small upside on the stock alone and the opportunity to collect that 40 cents over that time frame has generated a fairly attractive return without the necessity for the stock really to have to go up all that much. Now, important too to, to remember that as the shareholder, you also get to collect uh, dividends. So not only can you benefit from the option right, but you can also benefit from the uh, collection of, uh, of dividends uh, as well over the period that you hold the, uh, the shares. So just some um, some uh, um, considerations for strike price selection. Uh, again, remember that um, that we have choices uh, as an investor when we're looking to execute any of these strategies that we're talking about. Uh, when we're referencing strike price selection more specifically to the uh, option writer, um, the in the money option um, it has the highest premium, um, but has a very low time value. So. Uh, as a result, you've got a lower return on the position. So the in-the-money option right is really designed to be more of a hedging strategy, allows you to really um, significantly lower the break-even point on the stock um, uh, and, and would be considered more of a conservative strategy. Um, interesting approach here is um, an alternative to buying a put option for protection. If you don't want to put up... Um, the, the cash in order to buy a put, which of course we're going to talk about in the next section here uh, for protection. If you sell a deep in the money call and, you know, let's say, you know, the stock's at 25, you sell a $20 strike call and collect $6. Well, what's happened is you basically, yes, you've created an obligation to sell the stock at 20, but if the stock drops all the way down to 20, um, you get to keep the um, the uh, $6 premium. So in essence, what you've done is you've locked in $6 of your profit uh, in the event that the stock takes a fairly significant dive. Now, keep in mind the uh, drawback of using the deep in the money strike uh, call right as a hedge is that your hedge is only limited to the amount of premium that you've collected. So uh, something to consider as well. 
Now, for those of you that are really interested in just specifically uh, generating cash flow, um, the at the money call right has the greatest amount of time value and therefore um, allows you to collect the greatest, uh, uh, generate the greatest cash flow. Remember, time value is highest at the money. And so um, time value always expires to zero. So if we're collecting a lot of time value, this is where we're really getting the most bang for our buck as the option writer, taking advantage of that time depreciation, collecting as much time value as possible, generating the highest amount of cash flow as we possibly can. The trade off to that, of course, is that we, we significantly limit the upside potential. So we basically give up any upside on the stock for the opportunity to collect as much cash flow as possible. Now, the out of the money call option, right, um, is where we really want to leave upside for the stock. The trade off for that is is that we collect a lower premium and therefore we have less cash flow. So for those investors that say, you know, I still want to generate some cash flow on a monthly basis, but I'm interested in, in you know, the capital gains opportunity or the the capital appreciation opportunity of the uh, shares moving higher. This is the strategy that you would look to uh, ultimately uh, implement. So you get your in the money, more conservative, uh, collect the most in, in um, upfront cash, uh, can be used as a hedge strategy, at the money, uh, designed for optimum uh, cash flow where time value is, is the most and you are simply looking for cash flow and you're not concerned for stock upside. And then out of the money, you get a good opportunity to generate returns through the appreciation of the shares and you can collect some cash flow uh, through the out of the money uh, call rate. Expiration month selection, uh, front month, which would be, um, you know, near term or now uh, the option expiring, you know, let's say this month. Uh, generates the higher annualized cash flow, but is much more transactional. So for those of you that are concerned about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the commissions component of, 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 invest, of your investment activity, recognize that the more you, you know, more active you are, uh, the more commissions you're going to pay. The front month generates a higher annualized cash flow. It's more transactional, but it also gives you the opportunity to adjust your position. So on a month to month basis, if you're doing at the slightly out of the money uh, call rights, um, as the shares are moving higher, you can adjust higher. As the shares are moving lower, you can adjust lower and you can be a little bit more strategic with how you position yourself. Now, the further uh, out months provide greater upfront premium. So you're collecting more time value upfront and it's less transactional. So if you're concerned about commissions or you really just want to get as much money up front to help hedge for maybe short term risk, that's where you go further out of the money. It's really up to you to determine what approach is going to meet your objective. So there's benefits and drawbacks of, of each approach, whether it's out of the money, um, you know, in the money, at the money, out of the money for the strike selection or whether it's front month or later data month for the expiration month selection, you need to figure out what makes the most sense to you. So some of the considerations, is it short term trading? So uh, one way that you can take advantage of, of option writing, uh, call option writing, um, if you're a short term trader is, you know, you buy the stock, uh, you know, at the beginning of the month and you have a short term target, you sell the, the, the strike price at the target for that time frame. And you basically get paid to take profits at at, uh, at target. If the stock doesn't hit that target within that time frame, well, you've still generated a return off of that uh, the sale of the call, and you could do the same the following month. Retirement income, so consistent cash flow while reducing volatility within your portfolio. Uh, you know the idea that you can consistently compound growth. So in other words, you know if we can even collect two to five percent in option writing on a year to year basis and we can consistently um, you know, reinvest that cash flow uh, into more shares and more option writing, then you've enhanced your compound growth potential significantly. The, the idea is that um, we wanna get stock market style returns with less risk. So again, we're still holding the stock, we're still uh, participating in upside potential, but we're selling the call options to enhance cash flow and lower volatility. Um, so the option writing overlay here, uh, it, it becomes a, a much, uh, it becomes a very powerful way uh, to, to manage your portfolio. Uh, as long as, again, you're prepared for the potential to have to give up your shares at a uh, certain price. 
So finally, let's take a look at uh, put protection here. So the idea is that we want to create a hedge against uh, potential market risk. So we, we're going to purchase a stock or we're going to own the stock already. And we're basically going to buy a put option to secure our ability to sell that stock at a specific price. And that protection, that hedge is going to be valid for a specific period of time. So here we've got Doug here, and Doug's going to buy a protective put, so um, along with shares of, um, of uh, company ABC. So if Doug buys 300 shares of ABC at 80 bucks, um, he's buying those shares because he has an expectation that the shares are going to move higher. So Doug might be anticipating a rally up to $90. But Doug also realizes that, you know, what goes up also can come down. So he wants to hedge the downside risk just in case he's wrong about his outlook. So um, alongside of the um, shares that he's buying at 80 bucks, he's also going to buy an $80 put for $2.50 per contract that's going to be valid in the next four months. So recognize that, 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 that Doug buys the stock at 80 but buys a put option that gives him the right to sell the stock at 80, no matter how low those shares drop within those next four, the next four months. And he's paying $2.50 per contract or per, pre, per share or $250 per contract. So again, you could, your rationale for entering in the position could be technical, could be fundamental. It doesn't really matter. The idea is that you've got an upside um, you know, outlook on the stock. Um, you believe that the stock is going to move higher and you're going to pay a small premium in order to um, hedge that risk and identify that risk. So if Doug buys 300 shares at $80, he's going to put up $24,000 and then he's going to buy a three four month 80 strike puts at $2.50. So that's going to cost him another $750. So understand that 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 becomes that has to get added to your break even. So in other words, um, while Doug has paid, um, you know, $80 per share, that additional $2.50 per contract means that his break even point is $82.50. So in other words, within that four months, the shares have to be trading above $82.50 to accommodate for the put option that he's purchased. Now, that's a 3.13% premium that he's paid for a guaranteed $80 sale price over the next four months. The maximum that he can lose is 3.13% within that time frame. So again, the opportunity here is limited risk exposure, limited and identifiable risk exposure to the tune here of 3.13%, which represents the uh, premiums relation to the um, uh, cost of the shares, has complete upside for the stock, gets to collect the dividends and has defined the worst case scenario. So let's look at a couple of scenarios here. Let's say ABC shares proceed to drop over the next month and the investor's concern. Well, Doug can exercise the right to sell the shares at 80 anytime before expiration. So in other words, it's kind of like you get a jail free card. Stock drops, Doug thinks there's no longer an opportunity, takes the 3.13% uh, loss, moves on, finds a new opportunity. That transaction can be done by either contacting uh, your broker or if you hold until expiration, that, that put option will be auto exercise, which we actually discuss in our option fundamentals uh, video uh, on expiration. Shares will automatically be sold. And again, that $2.50 from the put buyer goes to the put option writer. In scenario two, Doug can hold the stock and sell the put. So let's say once again, the shares proceed to drop, but Doug's still bullish over the long term. Doug can sell the put option and realize a profit on the put, can continue to own the stock, but now has an adjusted cost base calculated by subtracting the profit from the put from the cost of the shares, right? So, and can maybe buy another put option, or if he feels that the risk is no longer present, can simply just hold the stock on its own until, you know, ultimately he sees maybe there's additional risk and go in and buy another put option. And finally, our third scenario here, the stock rallies, ABC shares proceed to break out. The investor continues to own the original shares and fully profits from the upside. The put expires and the investor has lost the premium, but benefits from the capital appreciation uh, of the, uh, of the underlying um, shares. Now, 
benefit of the protective put, you can take a shot on the, on the, on a stock position with a defined risk. You can reposition. So in other words, if the shares drop, sell the put for a profit, buy another put uh, at the lower strike price and continue to hold the position. Or conversely, if the shares rally, you can actually adjust higher and lock in your profits. There's no volatility stop out. So during the day when you get all these price, uh, you know, the prices fluctuating and whipsawing all over the place, if you had a stop loss in place, you could get stopped out just because of market noise. If you've got the stock plus a put option, that's there. They're, they trade independently from one another. You decide whether or not you want to get out of the position. So the shares could drop 10% in the morning, uh, rally back up in the afternoon. You're still in, in, in the position and you've had a complete hedge the entire time and can sit back and make an educated decision without having to feel panic uh, about um, you know, the, the, the fluctuating stock price. And it gives you the opportunity once again to lock in profit. So if the shares have rallied significantly and you, know, you feel that it's time to, to, to lock in your profits, simply add your protective put and, and continue to, to enjoy any further upside appreciation. Um, while locking in your profits, less the premium that you're paying for the uh, for the put options. So one main consideration, though, uh, is that if you're continuously buying expensive puts, this is going to increase the positions break even point. So you know you buy the shares and you buy a put this month, and the stock um, you know drops a bit, and so you know you uh, you are out your premium. Um, you then subsequently buy another put. Uh, and stock drops a bit again and so on and so forth. If you're consistently buying puts, every dollar you spend on puts adds to the break even point of your position. It can get to the point where it becomes a challenge to become profitable. So um, I kind of look at, you know, put protection as like a get out of jail free card. You know, you want to put it in place once or twice just to stay with a position. But at some point, you got to recognize that maybe it's not going the direction that you think it's going to go. Reevaluate and perhaps look at another opportunity uh, rather than, you know, uh, continuously buying puts and, and sending good money against uh, against bad. Um, because, again, you know, the 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 the, um, uh, the purchase of the put options on a continued basis can result in accumulated losses uh, over time. All right. So let's just talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, just a quick conclusion here. Um, you got to recognize that you've got many alternatives beyond the traditional buy and hold approach in your registered accounts. Very, very important to uh, consider that uh, income can be created beyond traditional means such as dividends and interest, especially for those of you entering into your retired years or if you're having to convert your uh, RSP into a RIF. Um, the addition of that op these option writing strategies, the covered call strategy, lowers volatility, helps mitigate risk, but ultimately brings in that cash flow on a monthly basis to perhaps limit the, uh, uh, you know, limit the uh, necessity for you to sell shares to, uh, to, raise that, um, to raise that cash that you need. Um, you could also reduce volatility and risk uh, by adding these option strategies to your portfolio. Uh, and uh, you can um, also uh, leverage your um, your capital with a defined risk. So again, within your tax-free savings account, you've got a limited amount of capital available to you. Um, you can diversify across a broad-based basket of stocks by limiting how much capital you need to put into each trade uh, or each position through the use of a stock replacement strategy like buying a call or buying a put option. So just as a reminder, lots of great information available on the Montreal Exchange site. We got um, uh, our blog at optionmatters.ca. We've got newsletters, um, videos and webinars, trading guides and strategies, calculators, position simulators, and a really neat um, uh, um, a strategy screener called Options Play that you can find uh, on the site as well. And of course, for more information, you can visit uh, www.m-x.ca www.m-x.tv. Once again, my name is Jason Ayers. Thanks very much for joining in and I look forward to catching you in the next webinar. Bye for now.